Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe the yeah. cycle. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats, the program will begin in just a few minutes. Thank you. Hi everyone, we're going to begin today's program. On behalf of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, we're so happy to have you here for this very important dedication. This week would not have been possible without our next speaker, which is our wonderful host, moderator, MC, Pulitzer Prize winning and Emmy nominated journalist, Jonathan Capehart, where you're so grateful to Jonathan for the generosity of his time and his heart this week. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jonathan Capehart. Thank you very much, Jason, um, for the introduction. Sorry, I'm gonna open my iPad here. It always works in rehearsal, never when you really need it to work. 
Uh, but Jason, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all very much for giving me the honor to serve as MC this morning. I'm gonna kick things off and start things with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would like to invite Mrs. Garba's seventh grade social studies class from Brown Education Campus in Washington, DC to come forward and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> you did great. Thank you. That was great. I felt like I was back in grade school. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Garba, and to your social studies class for leading us in the pledge. Now let me uh, introduce to you um, someone, we're in, we're in his workspace right now. He is Jeff Reinbold. He is the superintendent of the National Mall and Memorial Park Service. Mr. Reinbold. Oh, I should have seen the uniform. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Jonathan, Senator Harkin, Mr. Roosevelt, Madam Ambassador, Madam Speaker. Distinguished guests, on behalf of the National Park Service, it is my honor to welcome you here to the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial as we mark 25 years since its dedication. Today, we also celebrate the chance that advocates and members of Congress took on a bold new vision for a memorial. Different from previous presidential memorials, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial uses elements of stone and water and landscaping to tell the story of FDR's presidency. Dedicated on May 2nd, 1997, the memorial consists of outdoor rooms for each of the president's four terms. And the fountains and pools placed throughout these rooms re represent important, the important role that water played in FDR's life and they engaged visitors in the memorial. The water features in the stones also set the tone for each of the terms uh, of the, in his presidency, from the chaos of war to simple reflection. More than 70 million visitors have explored the memorial since its dedication. I'm also happy to say that with the help of the National Park Foundation, uh, we look forward to another 25 years and the memorial looking as good as it does now. Uh, last year we completed, thank you. I mentioned how important the water features are. Last year, we completed a $2.5 million renovation of all of the pumping systems and all of the water features that are so integral to the experience. Uh, we also are in the middle of a lighting project where we've upgraded more than 200 fixtures on the site to long-lasting and energy-efficient LEDs to uphold the architect's vision. And the lighting improvements will continue over the next couple of years as we look at the ground lights and the maturing vegetation on the site. But today we also acknowledge the accessibility advocates who pushed for the addition of a fifth room to the memorial in 2001, a prologue room to show the president's disability. I'd like to acknowledge Mary Dolan and the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee for continuing to champion, for continuing to champion, championing accessibility improvements in education and for their work in putting together today's observance. Last week, we unveiled accessibility improvements throughout the memorial that include new exhibits and signage. The exhibits present information in multiple ways, including text and graphics and audio. You also see that we are testing new outdoor waysides that include audio descriptions and touchable representations of some of the memorial features. And our website has also been upgraded with enhanced content and audio described tours for accessibility. 
We're excited that the work here at FDR is part of a much larger investment that the National Park Service is making. Uh, it will be $20 million in accessibility improvements in the coming months and years. And for those of you who are in D.C., you will soon see uh, new crosswalks, new intersections that meet accessibility standards, renovated elevators that are icons, the, the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials, replacement of the park's 1,000 benches and outdoor uh, exhibits with new accessible versions. All of this is to make them all more universally accessible by the celebration of the 250th anniversary of American independence in 2026. And the work here at the FDR Memorial is a signature project in that effort and will set the tone for the work to come. Addressing the White House Correspondents Association on February 12, 1943, President Roosevelt, with an eye on the legacy of the American people's accomplishments during the war, said, we have faith that future generations will know that here, in the middle of the 20th century, there came a time when men of goodwill found a way to unite and produce and fight to destroy the forces of ignorance and intolerance and slavery and war. Those words are engraved just a few steps from here. For the past 25 years, this memorial has ensured that we not rely simply on FDR's faith that the world remembers those accomplishments. The red granite, the water, the bronze of the memorial all serve as tangible elements, a perpetual reminder of Franklin Roosevelt's accomplishments and enduring impact on the world. And the National Park Service, we are proud to be the stewards of this beautiful memorial and of his legacy. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Speaker Pelosi, Ambassador Pierce, Senator Harkin, Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Kovler, Mr. Capehart, distinguished guests. I'm Mary Dolan. I'm co-founder and executive director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. And it is an honor to be here today to ce celebrate the 25th anniversary of this amazing memorial. It's also a distinct honor for the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee to be the host of these celebrations. Mind you, we're only two and a half years old and I'm very proud that we were able to be able to put this all together. The FDR Memorial Legacy Committee is a citizen-led organization formed in 2019 with my co-founders, Jane DeLand and Jim Dixon. We have a three-point mission to promote education about the FDR Memorial, to improve inclusion and accessibility so all can experience the memorial, and to preserve the memorial for future generations. Our organization was born out of the successful campaign in the 1990s for disability representation at the memorial, and is committed to sharing the diverse perspectives of the Roosevelt era and that era's legacy today. In order to get to this day, we owe a debt of gratitude to so many, including the past donors to this memorial, whose names are enshrined on the two plaques in the bookstore. Thank you to the many members of Congress, especially Senators Daniel Inouye and Mark Hatfield, for delivering this memorial to the American people in 1997 and to President Clinton for making this memorial a priority during his administration. There are two donors to these anniversary events whose names you will find on the plaques in the bookstore who once again have shown their dedication to this memorial and to the promise of it. That is the Judy and Peter Blum Kovler Foundation. And Peter and Judy are seated here in the front row. as well as the Gordon and Laura Gund Foundation. And 
I also want to acknowledge another significant donor for today's events, and that is Jane DeLand. And of course, there are many other donors who have helped make today possible. So thank you. I also want to give a special thanks to our board of directors, but particularly Helena Berger, who is our inaugural chair of the board of directors and our entire board and advisory board. And a heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Yes, they deserve. And heartfelt thanks to the amazing staff at the FDR committee and to MIDA Associates for orchestrating these beautiful events. And thank you very much to Jeff and Kim from the Park Service. Thank you for improvements, access improvements, and thank you for making sure the memorial looks as gorgeous as it does today. Thank you. And please know we look forward to working with you in the future to keep enhancing the education, inclusion, and preservation at this treasured site. So this memorial, it's a dramatic fusion of art, history, and memory, and it comes from the imagination and Lawrence Halperin. Stephen Graham, who's the son of the artist and sculptor Robert Graham, who contributed many pieces to the memorial, including the wheelchair statue to my left. He's here with us today. And Stephen, Stephen, we salute you, your father, and all of the artists and workers and the many others who brought this dream to a reality. And in bringing this dream to a reality, the FDR Memorial Commission in the 1950s and 60s, they set out that this memorial was to and I quote, serve both residents of the nation and the national capital. While this is a, nation, a national memorial visited by three million a year, it is also the extended backyard for the children and families of the district. So that's why we are so honored to have the seventh graders from Brown Education Campus, DC Public School with us today. Way to go, thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Garber, for being that kind of teacher who goes the extra mile. And to further fulfill this promise of the FDR Memorial, we are proud of our partnership with the University of the District of Columbia to enrich and improve learning opportunities at the memorial and in the classroom about FDR, Eleanor, and their times, and infuse new perspectives that speak to new generations. We have lesson plans, archival content, and a summer professional development coming up for teachers that we invite you to all learn about. For this memorial, as Senator Daniel Inouye called at the 1997 dedication, a living memorial. The legacy of the Roosevelt era continues to unfold and inform, challenge, inspire, and lead. And I have the great honor of introducing someone who knows quite a bit about leadership, and that is Senator Tom Harkin, who served Iowa for 40 years in the House and the Senate. He was the author and sponsor of the Americans with Disabilities Act and was influential in securing the addition of the prologue room and the wheelchair statue. I'm honored to have the Senator as a member of our advisory board and as co-chair of these anniversary events. I'd like to introduce Senator Tom Harkin. Thank you, Mary Dolan, for the introduction, but thank you for your great leadership. Is this coming through all right? Okay. Madam Speaker, first of all, I hope I can speak for all here today in thanking you for your courageous leadership, your dedication to democracy during these very perilous times. Thank you. <laughs> Members of the FDR Memorial Legacy Commission, public servants of the National Park Service, our seventh grade class from Brown Education Campus, our host, Jonathan Capehart, distinguished guests and admirers of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
We are here on a beautiful day to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the dedication of this memorial on May 2nd, uh, 1997. I remember it well. However, I would like to first remember six individuals. Now I wrote this, now I'm gonna add a seventh in the end and I'll tell you why. Six individuals who did so much to make this memorial a reality and what it is today. This memorial had a very long and kind of rather turbulent history. This area was first designated by President Lyndon Johnson in 1969 as the site for this memorial. Next would be former Congressman Claude Pepper from Florida. Congressman Pepper was a congressman during the 1930s, was a, an ally and a, a strong friend of President Roosevelt. During his later years in the House and in the Senate, see, Claude Pepper was a congressman, then he became a senator, he was defeated and went back to the House, and I was privileged to serve for, gee, I think almost, uh, well, for over 10 years with Claude Pepper in the House. During all that time, he was a strong advocate for building this memorial. The commission at that time became somewhat frayed because of certain disagreements, basically on design. And Congressman Pepper was asked to lead the commission in the 1980s. He re-energized the commission, brought it together as a forceful advocate. One of Congressman Pepper's last public tasks was to get out of his hospital bed to testify before the House Appropriations Committee on the funding for this memorial. Shortly after his death in 1989, the commission chair then became shared by two key individuals. Senator Dan Inouye, Democrat from Hawaii, Senator Mark Hatfield, Republican from Oregon. Both, I might add, were members of the Senate Appropriations Committee, on which I also served. They successfully guided the efforts in the Congress to get funding for the building of this memorial. I think Mary had mentioned that in her remarks. The other two individuals I would mention were not members of the Congress, but were so instrumental in the final chapter of the building of this memorial. Alan Wright, founder of the National Organization on Disability, and Mike Glenn, who was chairman and president of the National Organization on Disability. They were both so instrumental in convincing the architect of the memorial, members of Congress, and I might add, maybe a couple of fem uh, members of the Roosevelt family to support adding a sculpture of President Roosevelt in his wheelchair. Alan Reich spearheaded the fundraising effort that raised about $2 million to pay for this sculpture. Interesting, why Senator, while Senators Inouye and Hatfield were initially opposed to changing the plans and adding this sculpture, they changed their mind after the efforts of both Alan and Mike to garner public support and to raise the money for the sculpture. And both Hatfield and Inouye became advocates for adding the sculpture. And in fact, it was Senator Inouye who introduced SJ Res, Senate Joint Resolution 29, on May 1st, 1997, passed the same day by unanimous consent to add the sculpture of FDR in the wheelchair, which now adorns the entrance to this memorial. So I said six individuals. Well, I'm gonna add a seventh after talking to Peter Kobler this morning. Again, one of my great friends for all my time in the Senate was Carl Levin, who served on the commission. But I just learned something that I did not know. And that is that Carl was speaking to Larry Halpern, the designer of this memorial. And evidently, Peter Co uh, or, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Larry Halpern said something about what he was concerned there wasn't something for children. And Carl said, how about Fala? So the dog is here because of Carl Levin. So that's why I say now there are seven individuals I think we have to thank for bringing this to fruition. And so I'll say seven and I'll add Carl Levin. In his second inaugural speech, on January 20th, 1937, 
President Roosevelt eloquently spoke about what the New Deal means for the future. He said, and I quote, all the old truths have been relearned. We have always known that heedless self-interest was bad morals. We now know that it's bad economics. We are beginning to abandon our tolerance of the abuse of power by those who betray for profit the elementary decency of life. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it's whether we provide enough for those who have too little. I believe that Roosevelt's polio and his disability heightened his awareness of the frailties of human life. And that illness or accident or just bad luck can occur at any time to anyone. But that should not determine the worthiness of that individual to our society. He was sensitive to the plight of so many poverty-stricken Americans in the Great Depression. And his disability gave him the courage to act boldly and decisively to restructure the American economic and social system to provide a safety net and another chance for Americans suffering the consequences of the Depression. If Franklin Roosevelt had never had polio and later became president, I don't think he would have had the sensitivity and courage to provide that leadership. That's why so many fought so hard to get the additional statue of Franklin Roosevelt in his wheelchair added to this memorial. And that's why this week we are celebrating And that's why this week we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the de dedication of this memorial and the 21st anniversary of the addition of Franklin Roosevelt in his wheelchair statue. So I thank all of you for being here today, for all those I mentioned and so many more, for making this a reality. It's now my honor to introduce my co-chair on the advisory board for the commission, Jim Roosevelt. Jim Roosevelt has had a long and distinguished career, first on the Social Security Administration as Commissioner of Retirement Policy, President and CEO of the Tufts Health Plan in Massachusetts, Chairman of the Board for Massachusetts Hospital Association, Co-Chair of the Advisory Board for the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, started by his father, Congressman James Roosevelt in 1991. And as befits a Roosevelt, he has a political side too. He's also been the co-chair of our Rules and Bylaws Committee since 1995 of our Democratic Party. Jim Roosevelt. Well, thank you very much, Senator. It's a real privilege to be introduced by such a well-known, famous leader for so many causes that I've believed in all my life. Uh, and it's a great privilege to be here with all of you today uh, on my own behalf and representing the members of my family. Uh, we have a multi-generational presence here today. My daughter, Tracy, uh, who practices law here in DC, is with us, along with her husband, Rob O'Loughlin. And so I want to say just a few words uh, about what the memorial means to our family. Uh, the memorial, I think, means a great deal This seems worse than usual. I hope that doesn't mean anything. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, 
uh, a great deal, I think, to all Americans, and in fact to people from around the world, representing the great accomplishments and achievements of FDR and the New Deal, uh, and then the war, uh, the war cabinet. Uh, but it especially means a great deal to us in the Roosevelt family. Uh, I come along a little later. I was born right after the end of World War II. Uh, so I had the privilege of knowing my grandmother, who wonderfully is represented here as well. Uh, the, my knowledge of my grandfather comes from <coughs> represent, representations of history like this and from my mother and father and other family members and from historians like David Woolner. Uh, uh, and so on, uh, but I am privileged to carry on his principles uh, and try to accomplish equity and justice and a decent life for people all over America and the world. The, uh, it is true, as uh, Senator Harkin mentioned, and we heard a little more last night on the panel about how the original commission got to uh, agreement on this site and this design and so on. And by the way, that's not unique. Every memorial, I don't know about, I, I, I don't know about Washington and Lincoln, but virtually every memorial in the modern era has disagreements, not only in public, uh, in the public sphere, but with the, uh, but within the families. Uh, just ask the Eisenhower family <laughs> about that. Uh, uh, but they finally did reach agreement and one thing that the original commission agreed on was that there should be no representation of FDR in a wheelchair, no representation that showed his disability. And I believe that's because the people on the original commission, including a, one or two of my cousins, <laughs> were still stuck in the mindset of the politics of the 1930s, where there was a political decision <clears throat> uh, among FDR's advisors that he could not be portrayed that way. Fortunately, by the 1990s, let alone today, we lived in a very different time. It still took activity and protest by some of you in this room uh, uh, to bring about the inclusion of, uh, of the representation of FDR in his wheelchair. Uh, uh, as was pointed out on the panel last night, People knew about the wheelchair, but it didn't, it wasn't portrayed in a way that was, a, so that it became a focus. Portraying him here in this memorial would change that. And a couple of my cousins, yes, had to be persuaded uh, that that change needed, needed to take place. And ultimately, you know, the ultimate persuasion is sometimes uh, necessity <laughs> uh, uh, when it came time for the dedication here. Uh, President Clinton had to call together the, the disability advocates and the advocates for this memorial and reach an agreement in his particular way, which was let's sit down and talk about it until we've got it settled. <laughs> and they did. Uh, and that led to uh, a wonderful dedication, but also the appointment of a new commission <clears throat> to uh, agree on, it, it wasn't just that there should be a wheelchair in the memorial, it was, where should it be? It was not a foregone conclusion that it would be in a room of its own. It was not a foregone conclusion that it would be here at the entrance. There are many questions like that. And then, who should carry out that, uh, that creative assignment? I had the honor and the, and the great privilege of being appointed to that commission by President Clinton. Uh, and uh, we had the good fortune on the commission that Lawrence Halpern was still active. Uh, and so we began by working with him. And that was very important to us because we did not want to violate the artistic approach. That he, uh, as, a, as a US Navy veteran, I want to salute every time that happens. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the artistic approach and the great success that he had achieved in this, uh, in this design. So we got to work with him and he was very supportive of finding the right way to do this. And the first thing that we had to spend a good bit of time on was 
where was it? Was it by itself? Was it in the midst of one of the other rooms? Was it at the set back at the beginning of the first administration since he came into the administration in his wheelchair? Uh, and he worked with us and we reached agreement that this should be the setting. And then the question was, who should be the sculptor? Uh, and we again met with uh, Lawrence Halperin and discussed among ourselves. And we basically all, we reached unanimous agreement, but it was Lawrence Halperin who said to us, so there's a number of artists that you could consider, some of whom have done various other pieces in the memorial. Uh, but he said, let's start with Robert Graham, and then there's four or five other people, and there's Robert Graham. Uh, <laughs> so we unanimously voted for Robert Graham. Uh, and uh, worked then with, uh, with Mr. Graham for quite a few we weeks as he tried out different approaches and sketches and so on. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, the agreement on his, uh, on his concept was brought to us and we all thought it looked wonderful. Uh, and he was authorized to set to work actually doing the sculpture. And about two or three weeks later, my assistant came into my office at Tufts Health Plan and said, there is somebody on the phone for you who said he's a sculptor. Do you want to talk to him? Uh, and I said, is his name Graham? And she said, well, yeah, it is. OK, yeah, I definitely want to talk to him. And he said that uh, he had something that might surprise me, but uh, he wanted to tell me. And I told this story, by the way, to Steve Graham last, uh, last night. and I have his blessing to go forward uh, this morning. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, he said, I want to ask you, a you, I want to ask me a personal question. Uh, and obviously you don't have to answer, but do you, do you ever carry a briefcase that's a shoulder bag with a strap? I said, well, no, because it always, those don't work, they fall off. Uh, and he said, well, not for everybody, only for people who's shoulders are sloped the way your grandfathers were. Uh, and he said, that's the first thing I noticed when I met you at the commission meeting, that you have that same outline that, uh, that he did. Uh, and he never carried anything that way, and you never will either. Uh, but what I want to tell you is that when I'm sculpting a person who is a, a, a figure from real life, uh, and as you know, Robert Graham has many, many wonderful sculptures. Some of them are mythical figures, some of them are monumental, things like, the, like cathedral doors. Uh, uh, but when I'm sculpting someone uh, who's a real person from real life, to get it right, I am fortunate and I, what's the best thing I can have is some of the DNA in front of me. You're the DNA. And so he invited me out to his studio in Venice, California, where he had already, from uh, costumers in Hollywood, uh, selected a selection of clothing that he wanted me to wear while he sketched me, uh, including a hat and a cigarette holder and things like that. Uh, and, uh, and so I was in costume uh, uh, for this session. Uh, uh, and then he said, now, what I want to do is take you over to uh, Burbank, where Disney Studios has one of the four cameras in the United States uh, that do 300, at that point, 360 degree pictures. And take a, some 360 degree pictures of you uh, that I can use for reference as I work on this sculpture. Uh, believe it or not, Steve Graham was there that day. Uh, I was a lot younger then, and so was he, but yeah. <laughs> but, but at any rate, we went over and took those pictures, uh, and, uh, and that's what he worked from doing this. So as my daughter Tracy knows, and has known ever since she first came here, when it was first dedicated, that when she looks at the statue, she says, my great-grandfather uh, and, uh, and my dad, there they are. <laughs> so that's my story, uh, because he also swore me to secrecy. He, he also said, I don't want people to know that's how I work. 
uh, because that would give them a leg up. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I think it's now, and Steve agrees, it's now okay to let that be known generally. That's the thing, that DNA every day gives me a very special feeling for this monument and for the people we worked with in the disability community. The, uh, some of you have had an opportunity to work with on social security issues, uh, which are very important to me. But working together on this was a highlight of my life. And thank you for being here. And thank you for everything you've done. Thank you very much, Jim. Now it's my honor to introduce to you the British Ambassador to the United States, Karen Pierce. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, Senator Harkin, Mr. Roosevelt, Jonathan, uh, friends and colleagues, it's the most enormous honor to be able to join you today. It's a professional honor. Uh, FDR was a true and great friend uh, to my country, to the United Kingdom, in our darkest hour. Uh, and he was there uh, throughout the build-up to the Second World War and most of the war itself. Uh, and he and Churchill uh, have gone down uh, in legend uh, as well as history uh, for that solidarity and that friendship and that support. Uh, but it's also a great personal uh, moment for me to be here with you as we heard uh, from Mr. Roosevelt and Senator Harkin in this truly beautiful and fitting setting uh, with all its fantastic access uh, and such an important precedent uh, for monuments everywhere. Uh, but it's particularly personally relevant because uh, I was first posted here when President Clinton was elected in 1992 and the commission for the memorial was getting going and the campaign and the funding uh, were getting going uh, and the British Embassy had the honour to make a contribution. Uh, more importantly, the late Queen Mother, uh, also called Queen Elizabeth, made a personal contribution out of recognition of the friendship that FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt had shown to her personally and to King George VI when they came to America on a visit before the war, but also for all the solidarity throughout the Second World War. So thank you, America, uh, for this president who has done so much uh, to forge transatlantic uh, bonds. I think I would say that FDR was, as well as a visionary, he embodied the transatlantic relationship. I think he'd be proud to see how deep, extensive, profound and successful the relationship between the US and the UK has become. He sadly was not alive when Churchill coined the phrase special relationship, but I think he would have understood uh, every word that Churchill said uh, at that time. Uh, and I think one might think of Churchill in 1941 uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, which I had the honor to go to Hawaii and commemorate in December, uh, a very moving uh, 80th uh, memorial. Um, I think Churchill, who invited himself out uh, to stay in the White House after that awful bombing, I think one might think of him as the world's most consequential uh, uninvited guest. And I think FDR and Eleanor had him on the premises for something like six weeks, uh, which is the mark of, of true uh, friendship. Also in 1941, uh, FDR and Churchill produced the Atlantic Charter uh, that went on to become the foundation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization of NATO. But one of the most important things about that charter was that fundamentally it was a defense of freedom, it was a defense of liberty, and it was a setting out of the value that open societies and transparency and science brings to ordinary citizens. And I think, as we've heard from Senator Harkin and Mr. Roosevelt, 
uh, that sense of what mattered to ordinary citizens and how to improve their lives uh, really was, was there woven throughout uh, FDR's political career. And this, this very important Atlantic Charter embodies that. And I'm pleased to say that President Biden and our Prime Minister Boris Johnson were able to produce the new Atlantic Charter when the President visited the UK last year uh, in Cornwall. Uh, freedom, most of all, in the face of tyranny. In 1941, of course, it was the threat of the Nazis and of what Hitler was doing in Europe. Uh, we can all think now of the parallels uh, with Ukraine uh, and why it becomes ever more important to make sure that liberty and open societies succeed in the face of the authoritarianism and the barbarism that we see inflicted uh, on Ukraine today. And I think we can all take heart and courage from the steadfast resolve that both FDR and Churchill showed uh, back in the dark days of the 1940s. And we salute the Ukrainian people as they try and win back uh, their country, uh, and we will help them uh, to the best of our ability. And I know, Madam Speaker, that you have taken a very strong uh, stand on that, and thank you uh, very much for that. <laughs> Indeed, FDR spoke of the American people as the great arsenal of democracy. Uh, and even more important than that very evocative phrase, uh, he went on to say that preserving uh, and extending democracy was an emergency as deep as war itself. And I think we think of that when we think of what our Ukrainian friends are doing today and their uh, heroic acts. One of my previous roles, I had the honor to be the British ambassador uh, at the United Nations uh, up in New York. And of course, it wasn't just about the Second World War. Every day in the UN, we remember that FDR didn't just uh, bring victory uh, in the Second World War. He also has based international system that we rely on so much today and that we are trying so hard to preserve. You may not know that there is a monument to FDR in Westminster Abbey. Um, the stone tablet was first dedicated by Churchill and the then Prime Minister Clement Attlee in 1948. It is the first time that the head of state of a foreign country has been commemorated in Westminster Abbey. The tablet is located fittingly near the tomb of the unknown soldier, but also a memorial to his friend Winston Churchill. And the inscription describes President Roosevelt as a faithful friend of freedom and of Britain, we will always remember what FDR and the American people did for us. We will always repay that debt and be your friend to the last. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Now I'd like to call up to the podium Peter Kovler who, among many things, is a major donor of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, but he's also the director of the Marjorie, Marjorie Kovler Fund and founder of the Kovler Center for Victims of Torture. Mr. Kovler. Uh, can you all hear me? It's an airport day at the memorial. If you can't, please wave or something in the background. There's always a surprise out here. Today's surprise is the activity from National Airport. By the way, this was realized by San Francisco's Larry Halperin because National Airport uh, was the creation of Franklin Roosevelt, and we always knew that the water and the sound from the airport might become an issue. Even after 25 years of countless visits to this memorial, plus six preceding years, of visits when this was simply one big massive construction site, I still find it humbling to be here. How humbling as well to be at this sacred space, I use the word sacred guardedly, one equally sacred to the country in my opinion, to the physical memorialization to the two other great presidents, our temple 
right out there to Abraham Lincoln, and our monument right out there to George Washington. Adding in the fact that we are here at this critical and existential moment, so close to the celebration of VE Day in Europe, this thing called Victory Day in Russia, so close to the current war in Europe, and just two days after President Biden has signed a Lend-Lease Act, obviously inspired by Franklin Roosevelt, I must add what a humbling and honor it is for me to introduce one of the most significant public servants of our time, or any time, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She has been like the most dedicated of New Dealers and Dr. New Deal himself, irrepressibly faithful to the American people, irrepressibly faithful to an unparalleled moral and civic compass. Just let me for a moment list a little bit of what she has done and its connection to Franklin Roosevelt's inspiration or memory. In 2008, she was critical to the rescue of the American economy when we came so close so very close to a second Great Depression. And in case you need a refresher on what a depression or a Great Depression might mean, I suggest a little walk, it's not much, through rooms one and two. That will give you at least an artist's interpretation of what life might have been like, though I suggest you read and learn more. Maybe it's a stimulation to learning more. A short time later in 2010, she played the key role, the key role, in creating the Affordable Care Act, a completion, really, I think any historian would agree, of FDR's Social Security Act. On this one, I can tell you I saw her work with my own eyes as I sat in the House Gallery watching her buttonhole every wavering congressman, one wavering congressman after another. More recently, she has pleaded with us to believe in science. She believes so strongly in it, she says things like science, 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 and massive federal assistance as the way to take on the virus that has killed one million of our fellow citizens. Last, and without any FDR era precedent that I can see, how courageous to take on January 6th mob that threatened her personally, threatened her staff, threatened her colleagues, threatened our democracy at the very same time. Looking at, thank you, Madam Speaker. Looking ahead just a little, who could doubt her upcoming leadership in taking on an extremist Supreme Court, likely even a Supreme Court as sinister as the one that FDR faced. With so many similarities to one of her heroines, Frances Perkins, she has never ever stopped pushing us to make life better for those who find themselves in need of a hand, in need of a break, where accident, as Senator Harkin referred, makes their lives much more difficult than the rest of us who take our lives as they are for granted. But just as both the memorial and FDR himself were forced to go from New Deal priorities to war priorities, she has demonstrated the clear thinking of knowing when to reject war and when to see it is necessary. In room three back here, you can go back there, it's open to the public, anybody can go. FDR is quoted as saying, I hate war. I have no doubt this is where the speaker stands and this could not have come through more than her determined opposition to the Iraq war. I'm gonna stop for a minute because that's FDR talking to us through National Airport. But like the commander in chief honored here, she also has known when war is the only possible alternative. Like FDR facing dictators in Europe and an expansionist empire in Japan, she is so very well aware that there are moments when we have to be the arsenal of democracy as is chiseled into the stone here in room three, and that this is, forgive me, 
that the only way to deal with 21st century fascists, such as the current leader of Russia, is by assertiveness and war, or some kind of conflict. Last night, I got to add that she was heroic still again. It's like uh, she's her, her, nor, her heroism or his normalcy. She, when she called out Mr. Putin for being a coward, for attacking civilians and children in Ukraine. It's the first time I've heard the word coward in reference to this terrible, terrible man. About 15 years ago, I had a first chance to introduce the speaker, and I was quite proud to see that Congresswoman Anna Eshoo put those comments in the congressional record. At that time, I took a bit of a chance and said that Ms. Pelosi was our country's, in the entire country's history, our single most important speaker, surpassing the 19th century's Henry Clay and the 20th century's Sam Rayburn. Now looking back, I am confident in saying that I was actually understating her meaning to this country. In my opinion, she is now our 21st century FDR. And while her title might not be president, it might as well be. She has been our guiding star. Ladies and gentlemen. I was telling Jonathan how embarrassing this all is. Except that I accept every kind word. I accept every kind word on behalf of my colleagues in the Congress who had the courage to support all of the things that you said. I just have the privilege of getting the credit, but they have had the courage to get the job done. Thank you so much, Peter Kovler. Thank you and Judy for your leadership in making so many wonderful things possible based on values and presented with great beauty uh, for your longstanding leadership to preserve and promote the legacy of Frank, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, in the interest of time, I will associate myself with the remarks of so many have gone before about the beauty and the values and all the leadership of Franklin Roosevelt. But I do have some things to say. So if it looks like I'm sticking to my notes, it's because in the interest of time, because there's so much, so much, much to say. But let me first say that we, uh, when the Brown Education Middle School led us in the Pledge to the Flag, and wasn't it lovely, and thank you to your principal. Since then, since those young people led us in the Pledge, we have been joined by scores of young people who have joined uh, us here today. And I want to thank them for being here and to say that they will be taking this message of Franklin Roosevelt into the very next century. So we're so glad you're here. You're our messengers to a future we will never see, but we want you to take a message of values and patriotism and Franklin Roosevelt into the future. Indeed, I'm so happy to see all of you and each and every one of you. Indeed, how we can never forget this tireless mission to help organize the centennial celebration of Franklin Roosevelt's birthday in 1982. Peter Kovler did that. Seems like yesterday, but... <laughs> and your ongoing support for the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. You continue to ensure <laughs> President Roosevelt is honored with reverence and the respect uh, that he is due. I'm also very honored to be here with Senator Harkin, chairman of the anniversary celebration and one of the chief architects of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Tom Harkin, he talks about it here and that's appropriate. He talks about it everywhere. He's one of these champions for people with, he talks about his brother. That was your original motivation, I think. And, and we had the pleasure of uh, welcoming him to California on time and time again. And this is always his why, his purpose. So how appropriate today that you've taken such a lead in this statue of Franklin Roosevelt in, in the wheelchair. Thank you, Tom Harkin, for being so wonderful. And Mary Dolan, thank you, Executive Director, thank you for your leadership and your very strong remarks. And, and thank you for acknowledging Elena Berger and so many others who we owe a great debt of gratitude. 
How about how wonderful it is to see Ambassador Pierce? She talked about the uh, memorial to Franklin Roosevelt in, in the UK, and uh, we are take great pride in the statue that we have of Winston Churchill in the Capitol, right at the foot of the stairs where the, that the British used to storm the Capitol in 1812. <laughs> But our reconciliation is part of our history. It's part of our history. Um, that was meant as a compliment. I mean, sometimes I have to interpret, I don't know. And again, James Roosevelt. Yes, it is in the DNA. Not just the form of your shoulders, but in your leadership. And I, as you know, I have seen it firsthand for decades. And now another generation of my family sees your leadership uh, whether it's, uh, again, our values, our priorities in terms of issues, or the politics to get the job done. Thank you, James. It's always wonderful. We've been friends for decades, decades, although he's much younger. <laughs> and how nice that Tracy is here. How proud you must be, your great-grandfather, your father. Now, let me just talk about this in a personal way. You know, as I said, there's a lot we can all say about the four freedoms and the rest. It's a, it's a lifetime of service and leadership and for us to take pride in it. But I take a little pride because I remember fondly being here for the dedication in 1997. Uh, I did hear Senator in a way speak those beautiful words. I'm a, I was a member of the appropriations at the time. At the, at the time, I did serve with Claude Pepper, as my father served with him too in Congress many years before. But I have to mention another person, Sid Yates. Sid Yates, he was the chair of the Appropriations Committee while much of this was going on of, of Illinois. And he, he was my chairman there and he, again, shared so many of Franklin Roosevelt's that a true progressive. And I also want, so let me say this, this is, I brought my brother Tommy, who was, had been the mayor of Baltimore, my father was mayor, after he was in Congress, my brother was mayor, to the dedication. He was in tears the whole time. He was in tears the whole time, because he's 11 years older than I was, he got to see much more of Franklin Roosevelt. So that's one personal connection. I had the honor of voting for yes. Right around the time of the dedication was when the idea for the statue came and then we had the vote that same year for the, uh, for the statue. Thank God for that. So let, and another thing, Lawrence Halperin, thank you for mentioning that he was from San Francisco. One day, Lawrence says to me, he was my friend, he said, I want to show you something in my studio. When I went there, I saw it all before anybody. It was so beautiful. It was so beautiful. He said, you can't tell anybody this is, you know, just a, a secret. I said, well, I won't tell anybody, but I have to bring some other people here so that you can pledge them to secrecy, too because this was for us. Well, one person I brought was the, um, uh, don't tell me but I told you this. One person I brought was the uh, head of the AFL-CIO, Jack Henning in California. And for him, he was in tears uh, to see it. So we take great pride in Lawrence Halpern's design and then interesting to see that he had input. But isn't it wonderful because it has places for people to sit, but more importantly, it has places for wheelchairs to sit right next to President Roosevelt. Lawrence Halperin, he was quite wonderful. Now, my father was a New Deal Democrat. He got elected in 1938, worshipped at the shrine of Franklin Roosevelt. Worshipped at the shrine. And he was the first member of Congress as chair of a subcommittee on appropriations to have a first lady testify, Eleanor Roosevelt, I have the picture in my office, you've seen it, in the speaker's office, of Eleanor Roosevelt testifying before the subcommittee on appropriations that dealt with St. Elizabeth's welfare ho uh, hospitals and, and that. So the issues and Eleanor Roosevelt's role in all of this is, of course, not to be underestimated. Uh, the, um, 
My father not only worshipped Franklin Roosevelt politically and governmentally and patriotically, personally, he named my older brother Franklin Delano Roosevelt D'Alessandro. There aren't too many Italians with that name. <laughs> Anyway, it is fitting that we gather at this wheelchair statue, which captures the president's poise, his resilience and strength. In preparation for the memorial's dedication 25 years ago, it was a moment of great pride, again, for all of us in the Congress to cast our vote for the legislation directing the construction of this important addition. And with the wheelchair statue, our nation embraced one of the greatest truths that Franklin Roosevelt, among other things, taught us. We respect people for what they can do, not judge them for what they cannot. Congress and the country are deeply grateful to the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, to all of you, uh, for the work to ensure every American can visit this beautiful place. Thank you, Mr. Reinhold, for what you said earlier and the guidance you gave us and to the Park Service for keeping it so beautiful. Indeed, it is extraordinarily moving to think of the countless children with disabilities who will visit our nation's capital and bear witness thank you, to this great American hero in a wheelchair, in a wheelchair. And in this statue, we will not only see themselves as, as an integral piece of America's past, but an invaluable part of our future, again respecting them for what they can do. As Eleanor Roosevelt explained in the quote inscribed behind this statue, President Roosevelt's disability was part of his superpower. She said, Franklin's illness gave him strength and courage he had not had before. She said he had to think out the fundamentals of living and learn the greatest of all lessons, infinite patience, and never-ending persistence, democracy. Indeed, in one of the greatest, darkest, nation's darkest hours, Franklin Delano Roosevelt authored a pillar of resilience, a beacon of hope to the world. At this challenging moment, we hear echoes of the grim chapter through which Franklin Roosevelt bravely shepherded our nation. Ambassador Pierce referenced this. Indeed, his tenacity and determination were crucial to securing the victory of freedom over fascism in World War II. And today, we continue to look to his historic leadership as the world engages in the battle of democracy over dictatorship in Ukraine. It is timely that on Monday, as was, as was referenced, uh, President Biden proudly signed our legislation reviving the Lend-Lease Program. This initiative helped him turn the tide of the Second World War and will now be pivotal in supporting the people of Ukraine. Because as Franklin Roosevelt knew then and we know now, we must never fail to confront the senator force of oppression because a threat to democracy anywhere is a threat to democracy everywhere. In closing, I haven't said that before, have I? Sometimes I say it twice. <laughs> Except I can't turn the page. Okay. In closing, upon the enactment of the Lend Lease Act in 1941, President Roosevelt called on the conscience of our country to join the fight for freedom. He said, The light of democracy must be kept burning. It is not enough for us merely to trim the wick or polish the glass. The time has come when we must provide the fuel in ever-increasing amounts to keep that flame alight. Others today have called us the arsenal of democracy. That is what we are. Today, our task remains the same. And to honor FDR's legacy, it is in each and every one of, up to each and every one of us to continue to keep the light of democracy, its precious flame aglow, not only overseas, but here at home. Indeed, God truly blessed America with the life, leadership, and legacy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Thank you all of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee for all you do uh, to preserve the stunning tribute to this titan of history. Thank you all.
Gotta give it back to you. I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to close out the, the program by also thanking Peter Kovler, Ambassador Pierce, uh, Jim Roosevelt. He told me to call him Jim, but Mr. Roosevelt, uh, an honor to meet you, sir. And Senator Tom Harkin, thank you all very much for your remarks today. I'm going to do battle with the, the helicopters and the traffic out of National to just close by giving four important things um, that I've learned over the last two days. Actually, five. Don't fight with helicopters. The, the first is something that I learned yesterday from Mary Dolan during our, our conversation at the panel at the, at the Capitol, where I asked her, the reaction to the wheelchair statue today versus the fight that she and many advocates, some of whom are here, had to go through just to get that statue there. And what she said was pretty incredible, that young people today can't understand, they can't fathom that that is a big deal, how important that fight was and how important that fight remains. So it is truly incredible that it is there, that it accurately depicts one of our greatest presidents. The second thing is, this is sort of a bookend to two days of events. Yesterday, it was not lost on me that the panel that we did at the, Capitol, the U.S. Uh, Capitol Visitor Center was the same room where Speaker Pelosi welcomed President Volodymyr Zelensky of Ukraine to address Congress. And the parallels that, that um, Peter Kovner and, um, and the speaker talked about in terms of the FDR era and where we are today in terms of the fight between democracy and autocracy and to be here right now hearing those words are incredible bookends for two days of celebrations. And the parallels between then and now are really bold. The fight for democracy versus autocracy but also the conversation around race and inclusion in this country that took place in the FDR era. And I'm trying to remember who told the story. Maybe it was Dr. Woolner who told the story of Eleanor Roosevelt, whose legacy we cannot forget or ignore when it comes to talking about the four terms of FDR, but who, because of her visit to Tuskegee, if I'm getting the story wrong, Dr. Woolner, you will leap up and correct me. Um, because of her visit to Tuskegee, that is how the Tuskegee Airmen got formed. Because she, was, she went and saw these black fighter pilots, she was photographed with them at a time when that was beyond controversial. That is the legacy of Eleanor Roosevelt. That is the legacy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And so it is an incredible thing to think about where we were as a nation, where we are as a nation right now, how far we've come, and how far we have yet to go. But I do believe very much in this country, and I do believe that we will get through this, and we'll get through this together. Thank you all very, very much for coming to this 25th anniversary celebration.